Colia at Kesht ever a hay in question number one, please. Uh, thank you for the question. The Reducing Offending in Partnership, or ROP, is a multi-agency approach led by the Police Service of Northern Ireland to in preventing crime and reoffending, which focuses on the most persistent and prolific offenders as identified by criminal justice partners. It uses proactive engagement to prevent and reduce crime and delivers tailored interventions as part of individual action plans based on assessed risks and needs. Within the PSNI, the work was initially developed as a specific project, but has now become mainstreamed and integrated within the organisation, with reducing offender units, well-established and designated officers in place. As this is in the main an operational issue, PSNI reports on ROP on a regular basis to the Northern Ireland Policing Board. My department and its agencies continue to be engaged in the identification and assessment of individuals, along with the delivery of interventions and supervision. I'm aware the review of the police service role in ROP and how they manage repeat offenders has been commissioned. This is essentially an internal PSNI review undertaken with a view to commending a way forward, which reflects a broader change in crime trends, a changing operational environment and the impact of vulnerability in our communities. The police service view this as a maturing of the, review, uh, of the offenders programme and a move to a new level of collaborative service delivery. I look forward to hearing the outcome of that review. I call her Leah Flynn supplementary. Gormi, I would thank the Minister for her answer. Um, I would just like to ask also what mechanisms um, are there in place for reporting on the impact um, of work to reduce offending for sharing good practice and from learning from um, experience to date? Gormi, I well, as part of the work um, that the PSNI do, they first of all try to identify offenders. Um, who are at risk of reoffending, and then work with them alongside partner agencies and the community based on the risk assessments that they carry out um, in order to try to prevent reoffending. So I think that it is possible, therefore, using a managed set of interventions sequenced and tailored to respond to the risks and needs of the individual, to then have a measurable outcome in terms of whether or not that person later goes on to reoffend. Of course, the interventions have a key aim of trying to disrupt the individual's criminal activity, but it is also about supporting compliance and reducing their, their offending and giving them the other support that they may need in order to be able to desist from offending um, and have more productive lives in the community. Thank you. And I call Rachel Woods. For answer, can I ask the Minister for an update on the delivery of a Centre of Restorative Excellence in Northern Ireland to contribute to reduction of reoffending interventions? Well, I thank, the Minister, uh, I thank the member for her question. There is ongoing work in terms of the restorative justice element. We have already signed off on the new arrangements um, in terms of the basic plans for restorative justice and people have now, um, I have signed off on those to take it forward and we will of course continue to make progress in that regard. I believe that restorative justice, um, far from being an easy option, is one that challenges offenders in terms of having to confront the impact that their actions have on their victims um, and is a good way for us um, to deliver the kind of responsive justice that I think most people in this chamber would wish to see. And so I believe that by properly um, adjudicating, measuring and quantifying the work that's done um, in partnership with, with other parts of the justice system, we can use restorative justice in a way to bring home to people who are offending um, the seriousness of their crimes, but also um, hopefully to support victims in saying that the crime that has been committed against them has not just be acknow uh, been acknowledged, but the reparation for that has been made. But the, the centre will go Ahead, as we had previously discussed, and I'm happy to bring an update um, to the Justice Committee in due course as we make further progress in that regard. A question two has been withdrawn, and I move to question three and call Catherine Kelly. Question three, Little Hall, question three. Although the operational responsibility for leading this pilot lies with the judiciary, I'm grateful for the opportunity to place on record my thanks to Her Honour Judge Smith for initiating this pilot to fast-track serious sexual offences cases involving children under 13 years old to the Crown Court. I would also like to thank the NSPCC Young Witness Service and Criminal Justice Partners for signing up to the voluntary protocol and for their hard work and dedication to improving the experience of child victims of serious sexual assault. This judge-led pilot applied to cases received by the PSNI from the 1st of September 2019. 
It was a one-year pilot and the multi-agency group, which has taken this work forward, is now reflecting on the application of the protocol. It will report back at its next meeting later this month to determine whether and how the protocol can be continued on a voluntary basis. My department will also wish to consider any lessons or best practice arising from the pilot and we'll continue to work with our criminal justice and voluntary sector partners to improve the experience of the criminal justice system for children at what must be an extremely traumatic time in their young lives. I call Catherine Kelly, supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. The Barnahus model of how child victims and witnesses are dealt with and assessed for serious crime or sex offence cases is an international gold standard for responding to the unique needs of children. Can the Minister tell us whether she plans to introduce a similar system here? Well, I'm pleased um, to be able to respond to that specific issue because, as the member will be aware, um, implementation of the Gillen Review into law and procedures in serious sexual offences is a key priority for me and for my department. The department, working with multi-agency partners, has developed a phased implementation plan for Gillen, which prioritises the recommendations which will have the greatest impact on complainants going through the system, including children. There are four strategic priority areas, which include remote evidence centres, separate legal advice and representation for complainants pre-trial, support for child victims, including the Child House or Barna House um, type model, and also committal reform. So we are in the process then of bringing those work streams forward to set specific deli delivery dates for the, uh, for the change, and that's going to be monitored by the Strategic Justice Group on Sexual Harm and overseen by the Criminal Justice Board. Move on to question four, and I call Sinead Bradley. Or Mr. Speaker. Um, with your permission, Mr. Speaker, um, I want to answer questions four, eight, nine, and eleven together. I have consistently expressed my concerns around the delay in implementing the Victims Payment Scheme. We have waited too long to have this important scheme in place, and victims have waited too long to provide support um, that they very much need as survivors of the troubles. In seeking to avoid any further delays, I previously indicated that I was content for my department to be designated to deliver the scheme. Following the recent court judgment, the Department of Justice was formally designated by the Executive Office on the 24th of August to carry out the administrative functions of the Victims Payment Board on the Board's behalf. Work has already commenced within my department and a project team has been established to progress the development of delivery structures under the new scheme. A number of important operational steps need to be advanced to implement that scheme. This includes the development of an IT system, deployment and training of staff for administrative preparations, development of a medical assessment process, and appointment of members to the Victims Payment Board. Not all of these issues fall within the direct control of the Department of Justice. However, subject to funding for the scheme being made available, it is anticipated the scheme could open for applications by early March 2021. The Executive has currently made $2.5 million available in this financial year to support the development of administrative arrangements for the scheme. A component of that funding will enable my department to advance um, a number of key priority operational activities. At this stage, it isn't possible to indicate when payments to victims may commence, as that will be a matter for the Victims Payment Board when it is established. However, every effort will be made to ensure that the scheme can open for applications at the earliest opportunity and that payments are advanced as quickly as possible. Although the Westminster regulations came into force on the 29th of May, the important issue of longer-term funding for the scheme remains outstanding. I am strongly of the view that the UK Government has an obligation to make the necessary funding available, and I am committed to working with the Secretary of State, with Treasury, with executive colleagues to ensure that all of that is in place. In that regard, I am due to meet soon with the First Minister, Deputy First Minister, and with the Minister of Finance. I know that delays have been deeply disappointing for many victims and survivors who need this important financial support. I share that disappointment, and will do all that is possible to get that scheme delivered as quickly as possible. As progress is made on the development of the administration arrangements in conjunction with the Executive Office, there will be ongoing engagement with key stakeholders, including victims and survivors groups, in order to keep them fully informed of progress. 
I just remind the Minister there's two minutes for, for answer for the questions. And I call Sinead Bradley for supplementary. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the Minister for referencing that disappointment and frustration that is continually felt by those victims. And I note your uh, reference to the operational steps, which appear to be quite detailed, and there does the, the recruitment exercises, etc., that have to be gone through. But given that, um, I think, most in this House are in agreement where a lot of the funding should be coming from um, regarding the, the finances. I would ask the Minister, within that capacity of building the operational systems that are required, could she give an anticipated timeline of when that structure will be in place that would allow for applications to the scheme? I thank the member for the supplementary. As I've highlighted, there are a number of important operational steps to advance before the scheme can open for applications and payments could commence. I remain committed to ensuring that this new scheme is operational at the very earliest opportunity. We currently estimate that it could open for application by early March, although a number of the operational steps are outside our control. However, we are currently looking to see uh, whether that timescale can be further shortened. Um, but there are a number of very critical steps that must be in place before we open the scheme for applications. The issue of when victims will begin to receive payments obviously will depend on how quickly all of the evidence can be gathered to enable a proper assessment of the individual applications. So officials have been engaging with the PSNI, with the Public Records Office and the Department of Health regarding the evidence and information retrieval systems which need to be put in place. I call Gary Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister uh, for her responses so far? Uh, obviously, we do welcome the fact that progress has been made in this issue. Shamefully, it has taken uh, much longer than expected. Uh, would the Minister give a view in terms of the substantial legal costs which have arose uh, from obviously the fact that the victims had to go to court to push this on? Where does she believe uh, that bill should be paid for? Well, um, with respect, um, Mr Speaker, to the member, um, I was not party to the ongoing court case um, and neither was my department, so it would be inappropriate for me um, to give any opinion on whether and where those legal costs should, should be laid. Okay. I call uh, Rosemary Barton. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, so far for your questions. Minister, can you confirm for your answer, sir, can you confirm that those people injured as a result of their own malicious actions will not receive this victims payment scheme? Yes, I can. Anyone injured by their own actions will be automatically um, ineligible for the scheme. Others who have serious convictions um, that may mitigate against them being able to apply to the scheme will be open to um, apply to the scheme, have those convictions in any mitigating circumstances considered in the round by the panel, and they will be the ones who finally decide on eligibility or otherwise for individual applicants. I think what is important from my perspective is that the decision as to who will and will not receive the pension will not be a political decision for me, but will be an independent decision made by the panel. Can I call Alan Chambers? Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you, Minister, for your responses so far. Uh, can the Minister disclose the specific eligibility requirements that would allow those with convictions of more than two and a half years to claim the payment? Well, the eligibility requirements, including the regulations um, and the explanatory guidance which has been issued by Westminster, are in the public domain, and the member is free, of course, um, to read those. It would not be appropriate for me to suggest how those might be interpreted by the independent panel that will be um, put in place, um, but it's fairly clear from the reading of those, the eligibility criteria that, um, that exists. It is also clear that it's not el eligibility to be able to apply, um, but it is what will be considered by the panel in terms of how they will take it forward. Uh, once they're impaneled. And I call Jim Allister. The Minister will be aware of the great anger and frustration amongst victims that it took a judicial review to break some deadlock on this matter, with the resulting delay and cost to the public purse. What confidence does she have that there won't be further contrived delay when it comes to the issue? of agreeing the funding, and is there their risk of another judicial review, uh, which would be quite shameful if that was necessary? Well, 
I think that whilst the judge did not rule on the matter of funding, he made it clear that the intention that he would have were a similar judicial review to be brought on that basis. He made clear um, that the executive office have a duty um, under the law to fund the department which is designated, which is now, as we know, the Department for Justice, and therefore um, it would be important that they are able to do that. There is a substantive point of difference here because whilst the Northern Ireland office are claiming that they, it's not for them to pay or that the money is already there as part of NDNA, that is simply not the case. The legacy money set as part of NDNA set aside for that was set aside for specific purposes around the HIA, which is also under question at the moment, but it's not accessible for other legacy issues and was not, to the best of our knowledge, having previously approached the NIO about the matter um, available for the issue um, of the pension. So we will need to make a joint approach as an executive um, in order um, to be able to seek funding um, to see the scheme through to its conclusion. In terms of my own confidence and how well we will be able to do that, I can only say that both the Finance Minister and indeed the Executive Office um, have sought to meet with me at the earliest opportunity to discuss how we can make that joint case um, to the Treasury and to the NIO. And I, I call Linda Dillon. My Cancorlia, has the Minister had any direct discussions with the Secretary of State in relation to funding and has he given any indication that they will be prepared to discuss funding because the previous Secretary of State said that funding would be sorted and that an approach would be looked on favourably. I have had those conversations. I have not had those reassurances, but I can assure you that those conversations are by no means concluded. I call Paul Given. Sure. Uh, the, the Minister will know Sinn Féin's position continues to argue for the perpetrator to be eligible. Uh, can the Minister provide an assurance that under no circumstances will that position that they want to take forward in negotiations in the future will delay this scheme? And furthermore, can she give an assurance that the, the Department for Communities, of which I have some sympathy with the Minister's position, would have been better placed to, to deal with this, will not in any way frustrate the efforts of her department in getting the appropriate structures in place for applications to be opened? Well, first of all, on the latter part of the question, there's no reason why the Department for Communities would be in a position to frustrate um, what we are trying to do. Whilst there is cooperation and collaboration in the executive, I think the judicial review, whilst I agree with others, it was very unhelpful and difficult for the victims, has at least brought clarity to the matter that this is a matter of law that needs to be progressed. And I think that that will be helpful um, in progressing any areas of future dispute. I'm also not aware of the Department of Communities trying to frustrate any um, engagement with the Department for Justice, and I would want that placed on record. In terms of the victim's payment regulations, they provide that a person is not entitled to the victim's pension where they were convicted of conduct which caused the incident wholly or in part. So that is as explicit um, as I can make it from the regulations. The judgments that will be made in that regard will be up to the independent panel, and I believe that it is right that it should be independent um, of political interference and that they should be free to make their decisions based on the regulations and guidance. And question five, I call Robin Newton. There is no specific offence for fuel laundering. Offences associated with fuel laundering are generally prosecuted under the Customs and Excise Management Act 1979 in relation to evasion of duty. Prosecutions for these offences are brought by the Public Prosecution Service on behalf of Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. In the years 2017-2018 to 2019-20, there were 16 successful prosecutions in Northern Ireland for offences under the Customs and Excise Management Act, which related to hydrocarbon fuels. I have a table which I will share with the member um, after uh, we, we meet here today, which provides the annual breakdown for each of the three years, but it was four, four and eight um, in each of those years. Um, penalties imposed in relation to those convictions included custodial disposals, suspended custodial disposals and monetary penalties. I call Robin Newton supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I thank the Minister for, for her offer of providing the table, and I look forward to, to receiving that. I wonder if the Minister uh, would accept that great success has been achieved by the PSNA, PSNI and the NCA over recent months in their fight against very serious criminal activity. Is it the case, Mr. Speaker, that the technology that has been used in those successes could in fact be used in the fight against those who are engaged in the fuel laundering activity? 
Well, with respect to the technology, clearly there are there are a number of factors to be considered because, with respect to fuel fraud, there are particular um, complexities in terms of detecting um, fuel fraud. However. Um, in the wider context, I think the important thing is that the relationships that are built between the NCA, the PSNI, and indeed on Garda Shikana have been absolutely vital in terms of disturbing um, the work of organised crime groups and preventing them from exploiting any industry where there is an opportunity to make profit. Fuel fraud has a far higher political profile in Northern Ireland because of the disproportionately higher level of fuel fraud when compared to the rest of GB and because some of the organised crime gangs involved have links to paramilitary organisations which brings them to the attention of the police service in more than one guise. I believe that by addressing the harm caused by these crime gangs, including paramilitary groups, that's a key focus for our executive as they work together, and it's a key part of creating a safe community where we can respect the law and respect each other. I call to Nia Bradley. Um, I would like to ask the Minister if she could give an indication as to how those figures for 17, 18 and 1819, I think it was, compared with earlier years? I wouldn't have that information um, to hand, so I would need to write to the member um, to, to clarify. But it has been, if you like, increasing. So it was four in the first year, rising to eight um, in the most recent year. Nicole John Blair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And could I ask the Minister to outline, either separate to the speculation of today or otherwise, what her department is doing to prepare for any potential uh, smuggling and fuel laundering challenges arising out of uh, Northern Ireland Protocol and EU exit in general? Well, there has been a lot of work undertaken, um, both in terms of preparing um, for the, the end of the withdrawal period um, up to December um, the 30th um, this year, and also it is important that we have in place robust communication measures between police forces um, on these islands and indeed beyond these islands because we have also recently seen very effective work done by the PSNI in terms of organised crime emanating from parts of Eastern Europe and indeed further afield. We should never fall into the trap of thinking that Northern Ireland is a backwater when it comes to the opportunity for creating crime, um, when it comes to the opportunity for exploiting differences. And Brexit will be challenging. It's why I believe it is so important that we get clarity on the economic agreements that are going to happen as part of Brexit, because you can be absolutely sure um, that every differential that there is at the border will be exploited by some crime, ga crime gang or other in order to try and make an illegal profit, and yet will potentially undermine valid legal business in the way that they can do their work. So it is important that we get that clarity on the economic um, arrangements and agreements, but it is also important that we put in the requisite, um, the requisite, uh, the requisite uh, alternative means of being able to ensure good uh, cooperation and communication between police forces, not just in these islands, but further afield. Moving on to question six, then, Colum. I call Colum Gilderney. Question number six, please. I remain committed to working with criminal justice and health partners to further improve how cases of child exploitation are handled. This includes working collaboratively to address strategic and operational recommendations from the Sujini reports on child sexual exploitation. The most recent Sujini report contains two strategic and seven operational recommendations to improve the practice and approach of criminal justice agencies in handling child sexual exploitation cases. The majority of the recommendations are operational and will fall to statutory partners to deliver. But the report recognises the importance of ensuring a coordinated, strategic, multi-agency approach to this important issue. It is important to note that my department does not have the strategic lead for issues related to child protection, as the member um, will clearly know. However, I recognise that more can always be done to enhance our strategic response and ensure that by working closely with partners we get the best possible outcome for victims. Well, Colin Gilderney, supplementary. Gormay Agat, Minister, for your, for your answer, and I will declare that interest that I have previously worked in this, in this area in terms of my social work job. Um, in our response to the child sexual Explo exploitation consultation, Sinn Féin proposed to extend the abuse of trust laws to include any adult who holds a position of trust, power or authority over 16 or 17-year-olds. Can the Minister indicate whether she intends to legislate for that change? 
Well, I have set out my own legislative programme, as you're aware, um, in a, a number of months ago, and it is quite a heavy um, legislative programme. We have five to six bills that we'll need to pass um, by the time we end this mandate, which is, I think, a marathon effort, both for myself and, if I may say, for the committee, um, for, for the Justice Committee, um, who have been um, incredibly cooperative in that regard. It is not at this point um, within the list of things that we are taking forward here, but it would not be for the Department for Justice um, to take that forward because we're not the lead agency. It would be for the Department of Health to bring forward those changes, and they may have some capacity in terms of their legislative programme to do so. And if they choose to do so, we will work closely with them when it comes to things like penalties um, and so forth, uh, and so forth uh, as they develop their plans. Question number seven, I call John Stewart. In 2019, uh, the Northern Ireland Court of Appeal confirmed that the normal level of sentence for the attempted murder of a member of the security forces is in the region of 25 years imprisonment, and in some cases, a sentence in excess of 25 years may well be proper. This aligns with the sentencing guideline case for the murder of a police officer, where a life sentence with a tariff of 25 to 30 years may be appropriate. The tariff set by the court, after considering sentencing guidance, and any aggravating and mitigating factors in the case um, will be the minimum period the convicted person must spend in prison before being considered for release. No remission is available on a tariff. After release, the person remains on licence for the rest of their life and may be recalled to prison if they breach the terms of that licence. My department's recent consultation on sentencing included an examination of the current sentencing guidance mechanism for Northern Ireland and the setting of tariffs on murder cases. A report on the responses to that consultation is due to be published shortly. Oh, John Stewart, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for answer. I'm conscious that there is an ongoing uh, motion debate in the House at this moment in time, but the question was submitted prior to that getting onto the agenda. Um, there does seem to be, in recent years, a never-ending series of reviews and consultations on sentencing tariffs, particularly for crime, including murder. Um, five years ago, a former MLA asked a former Justice Minister about this very issue of leaning at sentences handed down to the murders of Constable Stephen Carroll. Nothing seems to have changed in that five years. Um, could I ask the Minister, is it the position of the executive that sentencing tariff guidelines for the murder or attempted murder of public servants, including police officers, need to be toughened up and brought in line with the rest of the UK and the Republic of Ireland? Thank you. Well, I thank uh, the member for his question. I would correct his assertion that nothing um, has been done in the intervening five years. He will, of course, appreciate um, that we didn't have an executive for at least three of those. Um, but in the last seven months, we have been able to take the review of sentencing, which was actually instigated by the previous Justice Minister, so the one following the one to which he referred, um, Claire Sugden, to be, to be clear, um, that the review that she, um, that she set up has now gone forward. They have reviewed the sentencing that we have and looked at the structures in place. It has now gone to public consultation. That has come back. It will be with me very shortly, and then will be shared with the Justice Committee and others so we can have that discussion. With respect to the view of the Executive, I have not taken the views of the Executive at this point because we do not have a policy proposal to take to the Executive for discussion. Can I ask the Minister to give an update on the sentence and review carried out by her department, please? Um, I think I just did in a very um, indirect way, but the sentencing review um, was completed earlier this year in February. My officials then undertook to go through the responses that were received to consider um, the issues that had been raised and to produce a report um, with respect to what may or may not be required in terms of changes to the current sentencing arrangements. That includes not just looking at the consultation but also the wider work of the sentencing review um, in terms of the impact on the justice system in other places. Because obviously we all appreciate that changing sentencing is, is merely the tip of the iceberg. The ramifications throughout the wider justice system are quite significant and so we have to weigh up all of those decisions very carefully. However, that, re that report will come to me, um, hopefully, um, in the next few weeks, and I look forward to be able to take in the time to reflect on that and, indeed, the debate which will recommence after this question time and the views expressed by members there. It is important that people have confidence in sentencing. This is the largest review undertaken for 15 years, um, and we need to get it right, not just get it done. That ends the period for a list of questions, and we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call first of all Declan McAleer. 
Um, does the uh, Minister share my concern that the NAO statement of the 18th of March on legacy uh, represents a major departure by the British Government to implement the Stormont House Agreement? I do share those concerns, and I believe that it was an unhelpful way forward. We have struggled in this place to be able to find any agreement on the issues um, around legacy and how we will take them forward. Stormont House Agreement was imperfect, as will any solution be at this remove from the events about which we are trying to seek justice. However, I believe that it was, um, despite its imperfections, the best and perhaps the last opportunity we will have to bring justice to many of those um, who, were, who were made victims during the period of the Troubles. And therefore, I believe that it is regrettable that the rather delicate ecology of agreement, uh, which often it, which often equates to simply um, lack of active opposition in this place, um, has been disturbed so dramatically um, by the intervention of the current Secretary of State. However, I believe that it is important that we continue to work diligently uh, with him to ensure that we have Article 2 compliant investigation because the legal requirement for us to deliver that from the Department of Justice element of this does not be removed simply because of the wishes of any Secretary of State. Nicole Daglan Magalier, supplementary. I thank the Minister for an answer. Does the Minister agree that, given the six years from the Stormont House Agreement, that it is unacceptable that the British Government is still in default of its obligations? Well, I think that a number um, of parties have been in default in their obligations over recent weeks and months, and indeed over recent years. And so I think that the important thing is how we take this forward. I believe that we need to engage with the Secretary of State, and indeed all parties need to engage, in order to find a way forward. Because with the greatest of respect, this is not about differences between us as parties, or differences between us um, and the UK Government's perspective. This is about innocent victims. This is about people who were shot, who were injured, who were killed, who lost loved ones, and who still do not have the answers for which they have been seeking for many years. It is about upholding justice um, in this new dispensation that we find ourselves in, in a way that will build confidence that justice can be, can be reached and, uh, and can be um, available to everyone um, concerned. We need to be honest and say that not everyone will be able to access justice, given the remove that we are from the events of the time. But I do believe that where justice is possible, justice should not be denied. And I think that we need to work together now to find a way forward through this morass, not for ourselves, not for political expediency, but because I think victims deserve it. And question two, Mark Durgan. John Corlea, and thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Following uh, the news at the weekend that a prisoner in McGabry has become the first and met here to test positive for COVID, can the Minister outline what work is being done with the South Eastern Trust to manage and minimise COVID risk in our prisons to prisoners and staff? Well, I thank the member for his question and I would want to first of all put on record um, my huge appreciation, not just of the work being done by the South Eastern Trust, but also the work being done day in and day out um, by the Prison Service of Northern Ireland to keep people safe who are in their care, to ensure that those who visit our prisons of necessity are kept safe, but also to ensure that we have a humane regime in place during a time when lockdown and other things can become very stressful, not just for prisoners, but also for their families. I think that all of those people have worked together very responsibly and what I would want to take away from that and what I hope members will take away from the fact that this was discovered was that the system worked. So by ensuring that anyone remanded into the prison system immediately goes into isolation for a period of 14 days so that if they do develop symptoms they don't then transfer um, COVID into the main prison population, that was effective. We were able to identify someone remanded into custody who had COVID-19. Um, and they will then be taken care of, as you would expect, with highest possible, um, with highest possible dignity um, for their case and respect for their privacy. But it is hugely important that we don't, we don't drop our guard when it comes to COVID-19. And I think that prisoners have actually played a huge role positively in terms of cooperating with what is a very different prison environment over the last number of months in order to ensure that we have maintained not just stability in the prisons, but also a good, healthy prison population. Mark Durgan, supplementary. Thank uh, the Minister for that answer. Uh, perhaps the Minister could expand on what arrangements are currently in place to manage visits and ensure prisoners' families are able to see their loved ones, particularly at this extremely difficult and stressful time. And are there any plans to review those existing arrangements? 
It is a very stressful time and it has been a very stressful time. I'm pleased um, that we have been in a position now to uh, restart in-person visits in the prison, though the mechanisms for those will be quite different um, to how they were conducted previously, both in terms of the volume of requests that we have received, but also in the protocols that will need to be followed in terms of the normal things that we accept in the chamber, wearing of masks, washing hands um, and social distancing and so on. However, we are going to retain the capacity to have the virtual visiting, um, which we put in place as an alternative. We want to retain that for a number of reasons. First of all, it is not always easy for prisoners' families to come to the prisons to partake of those visits, particularly if they are themselves vulnerable um, or indeed if they have um, disabilities which make their mobility, which, um, de which make mobility around the prison site difficult, um, or indeed for some children who find it um, quite frightening. Um, to come into the prison environment, despite our best efforts to make that a relaxed environment. Being able to see your family at home is something that prisoners very rarely get the opportunity to do um, and has been very welcomed by some of them. And in fact, when I was in, uh, when I was in McGilligan last week, um, I talked to uh, some of our officers about one gentleman who said that the highlight of COVID for him was that he finally saw his dog again um, at home and was able to be content that his dog was healthy, well looked after, um, and know that, that things at home were normal and that home was still there um, and the people around him were healthy and well looked after. So we will continue to keep both of those tracks in place. Question three, John Blair. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I ask the Minister to outline uh, what impact any attempt by the UK Government to undermine the Northern Ireland Protocol, as alleged in the Financial Times, could have on justice delivery in these islands? Well, first of all, um, like others, I have not seen the detail of the Internal Market Bill, which will be laid in Westminster on Wednesday. So I think it's important that we consider its provisions once it is properly available to us. That being said, I think any action that seeks to undermine the withdrawal agreement or the Northern Ireland Protocol could destabilise progress towards a future security partnership with the EU, which aims to support cross-border law enforcement and cooperation across Europe. My department has been working closely with law enforcement partners to prepare for the end of the transition period and ensure that the UK Government understands the key issues for Northern Ireland, such as organised crime, data adequacy, cross-border cooperation and the fight against terrorism, must be prioritised in order to avoid a loss of operational capability. It is also the case that when one signs up to agreements in good faith and then one does not follow through with them in good faith, people may be much more reticent um, in terms of actually signing up to future agreements. That does not only have an impact, I have to say, on the justice um, arena, but I think on the wider um, economic uh, future that we hold um, together on this issue. John Blair, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm going to thank the Minister for that answer. And in addition to, to the um, negative impact outline, can I ask that if such a distraction um, at this time is likely also to have a knock-on effect and very negative impact on programmes already underway, policing budgets, for example, um, work being done with partners for delivery for the um, public good, and a whole raft of effects right across the remit of the department and beyond. Well, I would agree that it is a distraction. Uh, some in this chamber will, will not want me to say that, of course, I would have said Brexit was always going to be a distraction. But having set that point aside, of course it is a distraction to the main thrust of the work that we have to do, because what we are doing is replacing um, complex arrangements, particularly in the justice sphere, um, which have allowed us to have the kinds of successes to which other members have referred against organised crime, both at home and abroad, um, to have the kind of successes that we have had recently when it comes to, for example, issues um, around counter-terrorism. All of those things are hugely important, and any distraction from being able to take that forward, rather than spending our time um, actually trying to replace what we already have with what are inevitably going to be suboptimal solutions, I think is a distraction. For example, the issue of data sharing is one of the key issues for our department. Uh, whilst it has impact on health, education um, and the economy, it has an enormous impact on the delivery of justice. Unless we have data adequacy agreements with other EU countries, we will not be able to do the real-time sharing of data that goes on on a daily basis, an almost hourly basis, between um, police and justice agencies across these islands and beyond. And I think it would be shameful if we were to find that the biggest loophole through which um, criminal enterprises could escape is one of not being able to have these issues addressed. Question four, I call Pat Sheehan. 
Corla, can the Minister provide an update on our Phase 2 plans to implement the Executive Action on tackling paramilitarism, criminality and organised crime? Corla I thank the Member um, for, his, uh, for his question. There is um, this week to be the first meeting of the political panel, um, which will discuss how we take forward um, the paramilitary action plan, the second phase of that plan. As you know, that there is a programme board which has developed the second phase, but I think what will set this phase out from the, the previous phase is that I hope we will have a fully functioning um, executive and the political impetus this time to put the weight behind it that is required in order to actually deliver results. I think the tackling paramilitarism plan is hugely important. I think that this is a priority for the executive and it is one uh, which all ministers will be engaged at at some level. While justice may lead on the issue, not all of the uh, um, implementation will fall to the Justice Department and it's therefore hugely important um, that that political coordination panel fulfils its role and is able to drive this forward with some enthusiasm and energy. And supplementary. I've got to go and break a selection arras of the Fregner. Thank the Minister for that answer. And I wonder would she agree with me that uh, full buy in and participation from local communities is essential in tackling all of these issues? Thank you. I agree that it is important that we have the buy-in of local communities. Of course, there will be those within the community who are opposed to tackling paramilitarism because they are the beneficiaries of it. Um, and for that reason, we also need to be sure that when we are talking to local communities, we do that through a range of mechanisms that allow us to determine what the actual views of communities are, as opposed to simply passing through gatekeepers in those communities. I think that's hugely important in terms of getting buy-in for local communities. We also, I think, by doing this, will help to reinforce buy-in in on the wider criminal justice sphere from local communities, because many of them feel um, that they are frustrated by the continued existence of paramilitary godfathers in their local communities, and I think a visible um, undermining of that current situation would make a huge difference to confidence in policing and justice more generally. Can I call um, question five, William Humphrey. Thank the Minister for her, her question so far. The Minister will know that drugs and the sale of drugs are a particular problem across Belfast and including the city centre. Uh, over the summer period in July, I met with the commander, the then commander for the police in Belfast, the commanders for North and West Belfast, and the officer leading in relation to the tackling of, of drugs in our city. Um, can I ask the Minister? Is she convinced that uh, enough is being done and it can be done? And I, I know the Minister will be reluctant to get involved in questions about operations, but can I ask the Minister, does she believe there's enough resource being put in to tackle this issue in our city? Well, again, I would be, as you're rightly saying, reluctant to um, pine on operational matters for the PSNI. However, I would argue that this is not simply an operational matter for the PSNI. I think that there are a whole range of agencies, um, including the work that we do through um, the Police and Community Safety Partnerships um, and through a number of other agencies with whom we work, with people at risk of offending, um, to, to tackle this issue. There is a role for the Department for Health to tackle this issue because many of those um, who are engaged in taking illicit drugs. It's often illegal prescription drugs as opposed to other drugs that may be available. And it's often in an attempt to self-medicate for um, harm caused by mental health and other stressors in the community. I think that there is work that can be done through the Department of Communities in terms of actually supporting people who are at risk and in need. So I think that there is a multi-agency approach that is required on this issue. But I do agree it is, it is, a, growing, it is a growing concern um, that we see the degree of, of uh, dependence on drugs and the degree of harm and destruction that they cause, not solely to the person who takes the drugs, but to their family and the wider community around them. And those who sell those drugs, I think, have to be the main target for the police because it is cutting off the supply as well as trying to address the demand that will bring an, an end to this particular issue. Sorry, members, but time is now up. Um, could I ask members to please take your ease while the Minister and members come to the Chamber for the urgent oral question.